and we're so excited to have her here today. Did anyone see her on the uh, on the Dan Marble Life last night? <laughs> she did an interview last night, and uh, her, her her life story is really interesting. Uh, Michelle is the uh, best-selling and award-winning author of The Faithful One, The Peacemaker, and The Runaway Prophet. Contemporary novels based on Old Testament stories. These stories are filled with the same suspense and romance found in the Bible, yet written so that today's readers can easily see themselves in the characters and understand what God is saying to them. Michelle has won several awards, including Book Excellence Award for Best Religious Fiction 2018, Seela Award for Best Suspense Blue Ridge Mountain Christian Writers Conference 2018, Greater Philadelphia Christian Writers Conference of the Year 2012, Maryland Writers Association Fiction Contest 2001. Through her book coach, book coach Michelle's services, Michelle has helped several writers become successful authors of several published books. Michelle has been a presenter or, or been on the faculty of the following book festivals and conferences. The Baltimore Book Festival, the Christian Writers Conference, Bay to Ocean Writers Conference, GP, GPCW Conference, Indie Author Day, Gatorsburg Book Festival. Uh, let's welcome her with a hand of applause as she comes forward at this moment. Thank you, Penny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I'm going to give this to you to take with you. You're Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you, Betty and Joyce and the committee for inviting me to speak today, be your keynote at the 10th Annual Vine and Vessels Conference. Yeah. <laughs> Now, although I was born and raised in Baltimore, and I currently live in Northeast Maryland, these parts of Lower Delaware are no stranger to me. When I graduated from the University of Notre Dame, I became a news reporter nearby and near my hometown in Bel Air, Maryland. And the first day on the job, I was the first female crime reporter ever to work at the paper. I showed up that first day all decked out in my new suit and my high-heeled pumps, only to end out in a big field where I met the police officers who were investigating a dead body. It stunk to high heaven. But even that did not prepare me for the story I was going to do down here. I was working at the Salisbury Daily Times and they sent me to a chicken farm. <laughs> there are a lot of chicken farms down here, right? Well, let me tell you that one dead body ain't got nothing on a pile of thousand dead chickens. Am I right? But seriously, I have covered a lot of great stories, and I believe that God has used all my experiences along the way to mold and shape me and help me to fulfill his purpose for me. So that's what I'm here to talk about today, pen to purpose. And I couldn't have picked a better topic for myself. I love speaking to writers about following their purpose in their writing. Earlier this year, I was a speaker at the Maryland Writers Association annual conference. And before the conference, they sent out a questionnaire to everybody attending. One of the questions was, why do you write? And they posted all the answers on the website and in the program. They were trying to come up with their next new slogan. I got home at the end of the day, like we do, exhausted, unpacking my stuff. And I found this mug in my goodie bag. And I took a look, and on it was the slogan that they picked. And I was delighted to find it was my answer. I write because it is my purpose. So thank you for picking this topic for me. <laughs> so let's talk about purpose. This is my favorite Bible passage from Romans 8.28. 
And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And I, you, we are all called for a specific purpose. Now we're called here today as Christian writers and those that help teach and inspire Christian writers. And I know we're all called to a general collective purpose, to bring people to God, to make a difference in the world, to build the kingdom. But I believe we're each called to an individual purpose, especially when it comes to our writing. Do you know what your purpose is? Do you know why you write? You don't have to answer that right now. And you might not know the answer to the question, but at least we're here today to ask, to search our hearts for that answer. My answer was crystallized. Uh, my purpose was found actually when I was reading a book by Deepak Chopra. He's a famous philosopher and author of The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success. And in it, he talks about the law of Dharma. He says, we're each given a unique talent or special gift in life. And when we combine that talent with service to others, we can fulfill our goal, our ultimate goal among all goals and our spiritual purpose. And I believe in my heart and soul that this is really true, but that hasn't always been the case. Now, I've always wanted to be an author since I was 10 years old, and I wrote a novelette and a spiral-bound notebook about a girl and her dog, never saw the light of day. But that dream hit me then. But it was buried as life took over. I graduated from high school and college. I got a job as a news reporter for several years. Then I went into advertising and marketing, owned my own ad agency when my first child was born. I started a home-based business, which blossomed for 20 years. Then I went into the corporate world as a marketing director. I got married, had three kids, got divorced, got remarried, acquired two more kids for the blended family of five. So life was busy and I had responsibilities, but along the way that dream resurfaced and that writing bug bit me. It was about 20 years ago. My youngest daughter was one year old and I said, you know what, I'm going to go for it. And I wrote what I thought was going to be the next great American novel <laughs> about a reporter and a destined yet doomed love affair. I write suspense with a little romance. That's what I like to read. And it actually did win first place at the Maryland Writers Association Fiction Contest for the drama category. And the prize was literary agency representation in, with the Writers House in New York. They're one of the top three literary agencies. Well, we all lost the prize. 9-11 happened and they were located in the towers. I was devastated and I'll never forget driving along hopeless and frustrated, and out of the blue, it seemed, a still small voice hit me. Michelle, you should write a modern day story based on the book of Job. Now, I wasn't a big Bible reader. I wasn't going to church much in those days, but I was familiar with the story. Job is that guy who has everything and then loses it all and then questions why me? Why do bad things happen to good people? And I thought, really? How is that going to make me rich and famous? because at the time that was my goal. <laughs> and I resisted it, but it wouldn't let go. So I started writing and it took me about eight years to write it. And I look back now and see that God was tapping me on the shoulder, that he was trying to bring me through some Job-like stuff that I was going through. I was losing my marriage through a bitter divorce. I was losing my business through a recession. I was losing my kids who were teenagers and I was losing my health through the, through the disease of alcoholism. And fortunately like God, Job, God brought me through to the other side and today I'm happy to report that I'm remarried to a wonderful man. We have a great relationship with all five of our kids and two grandkids. 
I'm living the dream of being an author, speaker, and book coach, and I'm going on 15 years in recovery. So that first book became The Faithful One, and my friend gave me the idea for the next book, The Peacemaker. He said, you should write a story based on Abigail. Still not a big Bible reader at the time. I said, Abigail who? And he said, look her up. And it turned out, I know why he said that, because I could relate. Abigail's originally married to Nabal, who's a mean, narcissistic, abusive alcoholic. Um, they say, what, write what you know. We get along now, though. Uh, and then she becomes King David's second wife, right? And she has to risk a lot and have a lot of courage to bring peace for the good of all. So wrote that book, and I started to do some speaking at groups like this, uh, book, book groups, church groups, women's groups. And I started to realize that my books weren't, didn't just help me. They were helping other people. After the faith, I did a talk on the faithful one, somebody came up to me and said, after reading your book, I decided to go back to church. And I was like, wow. And then I was discussing The Peacemaker, doing an author Q&A, and this young woman came up and took my hand and said, after reading your book, I realized I'm married to the same guy you used to be married to. Can we talk? And I said, sure. And one by one, readers started to contact me and say, you know, I'm getting a message of faith or hope through your books. So that encouraged me and made me realize it's not just all about being rich and famous. But still, like we do, I got frustrated that book sales weren't happening fast enough. God, you gave me this dream. Come on, let's make it happen. Let's make it into movies. Let's get it going. And I sat through a Bible study on Jonah and realized I'm still a little bit like Jonah, trying to run from that call. Jonah is the guy who goes to Nineveh. Well, he doesn't want to go at first and jumps on a cruise ship. So in my book, he goes to a modern day Nineveh, Las Vegas, called to work with the FBI on a radical terrorist group underground in the casinos, building a nuclear bomb. And he wants no parts of it. He jumps on a cruise ship and bad things happen. And I won't tell you about the whale. You'll have to read it. But um, he ends up back there and fulfilling God's call. But it's a story about, much more than a whale, about how you can try to run from God's call, but you can't really hide. And sometimes when you rescue other people, God rescues you in the process. So that became The Runaway Prophet. And I have another book coming out next year called The Jealous Son, based on Cain and Abel from Eve's perspective. Again, write what you know, I have two sons that have that sibling rivalry. They're 26 and 28 today, and that's going to come out next June. Praise God. So I wanted to talk about purpose, pen to purpose, but first I feel that we need a plan. You know your purpose, you're ready to write, perhaps you've already written or got published, you still need a plan for your book, right? In Habakkuk it says, And the Lord answered me, Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets, so may, he may run who reads it. Write it down. Write your plan down. You need to write your goals, your mission, your vision. Now, I don't know about you, but I can become easily distracted in this world. I have a tendency to get sidetracked when it comes to being online, right? Emailing, sending emails, getting distracted on social media. You gotta like your friends on Facebook, keep up with all that. And not to mention, answer the phone, answer texts, job and family responsibilities on top of writing, editing, proofing, publishing, marketing, and publicizing your book. I get tired just saying it, right? <laughs> it can become overwhelming. So we need a plan. And without one, it's like a person standing at the bottom of Mount Everest looking up and saying, how do I get to the top? You wouldn't climb Mount Everest without a plan, right? True that. True that. 
you wouldn't travel anywhere without a plan. Heck, I needed Google Maps to go from this church to the town of Georgetown, right? <laughs> Thank God for Google Maps. So you need a plan for you and your book. Or a year from now, five years from now, you'll still be stuck saying, why didn't I get there? And when you're my age, if you don't write things down, they go poof into thin air. <laughs> I get to the top of the steps, I'm like, why did I come up here again? It's terrible. A person that inspired me on writing down my plan, my goals, vision, and mission was Jack Canfield, co-creator of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. I had the honor of going to an all-day workshop shot with Jack, and there's a picture of him and I on my website. He's a great speaker. But even if you don't get the opportunity to go listen to him in person, get his book, The Success Principles. In it, he talks about how we should all write down 101 goals for ourselves, for our lives. It doesn't matter how old or young you are, write them down. And he also says, write down five action steps each day. He calls it the rule of five to get there, to get those goals accomplished. So, Let's just say your goal is selling 500 copies in the next year to friends and family. Well, I need to call up that cousin of mine and ask if she'll review my book. I need to um, email these friends that I haven't seen for a while and ask them if they'll please read it and review it and so forth. Say your goal is getting your book on the New York Times bestseller list. Well, you got a lot of action steps there to do. You need to send it out for reviews and Send it out to, well, you might first have to get it published. Send query letters out to editors and publishers and, you know, do that, invest in that marketing and publicity. Say your goal is getting your books made into movies. Well, you need to reach out to producers, right? So tomorrow I'm going to call that producer or send that email to that library where I want my books to appear. I want to call up a friend and ask her to write a review. Five, they can be simple things, action steps to achieve your goals. And Jack says in his, interview, in his book, he interviewed Lou Holtz, who is another hero of mine. He was my football coach at my alma mater, Notre Dame. Yay, go Irish. <laughs> and Lou Holtz, at the time he was being interviewed, had achieved 102 out of 107 goals for his life. That included visiting with the Pope, having dinner at the White House, winning a national football championship, and landing a plane on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> I know. My, mine were uh, the ones I've, some of the ones I've achieved, getting, going to Italy with my husband, five-year plan. That was, it was wonderful. Uh, getting on television. I was on WBOC last night. Uh, giving a keynote address at a conference. This is my first one, so check Yay! that off. Oh, thanks. Getting on the New York Times bestseller list. I've got a plan for my next book, so you just got to keep at it. So Lou Holt says, if you're bored, I never get bored, but if you're bored and you don't wake up every day with a burning desire to get things done, you don't have enough goals. Plain and simple. So these are two, like I said, of my mentors, heroes, the winners. In the 12-step program, they say stick with the winners. You got to find those winners and then find out how they get where they go. You need to surround yourself with good people. God tells us in Jeremiah, and I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Now, this doesn't mean that all people around us are actually good for us, right? right? We have to be discerning. But you'll, you'll know, and you'll fall, and you'll meet some people that don't have your best interest at heart, and you just move on from there. So when, when you do, let it go. Don't be judgmental and move on. I think most writers out of the gate are probably like I w was and can still be. 
wide-eyed and full of optimism and thinking that everybody, all our friends and family, are going to be hyped up about our books like we are. They want to get the word out, right? How great we are, how great our books are. We're, we're a celebrity now. We're a star. But that hasn't always been the case for me, and I'm sure not for some of you as well. My mom, bless her heart, I know she loves me, but when I told her I was quitting my day job a little over two years ago to be a full-time author, said, are you crazy? How, how is that going to make you enough money? You only had five people at your last book signing. Okay, mom, I got a plan, right? And now I limit what I tell her sometimes, Amen. right? My best friend from sixth grade is an avid Goodreads reviewer and has only read one of my books. Despite I've pleaded with her, I've given them to her for free. Please read my books, please review my books, you have a following. And the more I push, the more she says, no, I'm a little busy. Right, so you find out who your real friends are. We're still friends. I've learned to let it go. And even Jesus wasn't a big star in Nazareth, wasn't a big, big hit, right? In Luke it says, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went to the synagogue. He stood up to read. Wait a minute, isn't this Joseph's son, they said? Like, who does he think he is, right? <laughs> Truly I tell you, Jesus said, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Still, there will be other people who will amaze you. And I had this experience this year. Strangers that you haven't even met yet are out there. God's ready to put them in your path. You need to be open to them. Don't try to go this alone. We writers want to hole up, I think, in our writer's cubby holes and man caves and she shacks and whatever they call it now. And just don't. I'm a writer. Why do I have to do all this other stuff? That's what I said in the beginning. I swore I would never go on Twitter, and I did. So you can't go it alone. It just won't work that way. And I don't think God wants us to. The disease of alcoholism is a disease of isolation, right? It's in the fellowship that we find the solution. And God made us for fellowship, right? Yes. We're all here today. Pat yourself on the back. Don't compare yourself to others. Stay in your lane. Write what you know. Write what's on your heart. Don't try to write to the market because the market's always changing and trends are always changing. So do you. Last but not least, encourage one another. St. Paul says to be encouragers, right? And St. Paul, talk about mentors or people we can liken ourselves to. St. Paul was one of the biggest sinners in the beginning, right? He killed, killed Christians. And yet he was transformed and got the word out to all those countries. He wrote over half of the New Testament, sometimes from a prison cell. But he really got out there and spread the word. So I'm pretty sure he had what we in the writing world call a good platform. So Jesus says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? We need to invest in ourselves and in our books. Sure, we might only have a few hundred dollars, maybe not even that, but invest what you do have and watch it grow. I think writing a book is like tending a garden. God puts that seed on our heart, right? The seed of the book idea and the ability to get it done. But we have to do the work. We have to water the seed and fertilize it and pull the weeds, harvest the fruit, right? It's all part of it. So we have to do the work. You can't just sit back and say, okay, I'm done. My book's you know, take over Barnes and Noble, sell my books. Doesn't work that way. So invest in yourself, invest in marketing and publicity, invest in hiring a good editor or a good proofreader. You want your book to be as good as it can be to get out there. And 
ask for help. Jesus said, ask and you shall receive, right? Seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be open to you. Ask newspapers to do an article on you. What's the worst they're going to say? No, or not now. Uh, ask radio and TV stations. When I knew I was coming here, I called up WBOC and sent them an email. And they said, we have an open slot on Delmarva Life last night. All I did was ask. Ask Barnes & Noble in your area. Can I do a book signing? And if they say no, ask the smaller bookstore around the corner. Ask the library. Ask to speak. And I know that's not in everybody's comfort zone. Try to get it in your comfort zone. Look at Moses. He had a speech impediment, right? And yet the Lord called him to speak to the tribe of Israel to bring them to the promised land. Now, yeah, he relied on his brother Aaron to do the speaking for him, right? But that's okay. We have people and places to help us today. We have Toastmasters. I joined Toastmasters back in 2012 and I had a terrible fear of public speaking. I still can have that fear, but it helps you to practice, practice, practice among your peers until you finally are able to get out there. So speaking is the number one marketing tool, by the way, my publisher says, for authors. So just start small. It's like building a fire, start with kindling, and then you wouldn't put a log on there and say, I tended to shoot high because I'm an overachiever and I wanted to shoot to the top right away and I got a little rejection up there. So I said, okay, I need to start small with kindling. Small, groups of 10, do an author Q&A, start with your family and friends, start with your book club that you're in, and then build up from there. Start with your church group. There are lots of opportunities. You just need to look for them and then ask to, to achieve those. And Jack Canfield says, with rejection, when they say no, you say, next. <laughs> okay, uh, I've gone out of my comfort zone a few times and it's hard. International Christian Film Festival, my knees were shaking when I was pitching to those producers, right? But I got Michael Haig to help me and I paid him a few hundred dollars to coach me, me to pitch that, my books. Uh, I've also went to the National Religious Broadcasters. They have a conference every year called Proclaim. So next year will be Proclaim 19. They get a variety of great speakers. Pastor Rick Warren, who wrote The Purpose Driven Life, was there when I went. Roma Downey uh, and several others. And I was able to talk to them about my book. So it's all good exposure, right? And the Pope, when he came to Philadelphia, Catholic writer, hmm, I should do a book signing when he's here in Philadelphia. And I did. All I did was ask. I called the Barnes & Noble Rittenhouse Square. Can I do a book signing the weekend the Pope's here? They checked their calendar. Okay, I did it. So you want to do this six months ahead of time or at least two months ahead of time. And I had a great book signing. A lot of people were in town. And like I said, WBOC last night, this conference, leverage this conference. Don't just sit here through the workshops and then go home. Get to know one another. Say, how can I help you? How can you help me? Network. Make it work. So you need to persevere and have persistence. One of my other favorite Bible quotes I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. That's from Nehemiah. I'll never forget when I heard this and it became my mantra for a good long time when I was launching my next book, when I quit my day job and, and was ready to do that. I was listening to Andy Stanley on television. I watched Charles Stanley and Andy Stanley and Andy was preaching that day. It was New Year's Day and he was talking about Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is the one that rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem and he was faced with a lot of grief, a lot of grief from his people who were grumbling, you know, we're not eating 
and you need to come down here off that temple wall and help us out, you know, we're your people. And, you know, a lot of grumbling going on. And his enemies were ready to shoot him down off the wall. They're like, you better go into hiding, son, because we're coming after you. And he just kept going and built that temple. So you need to be that way with yourself and your books and your dream. Stick to it. Don't come down off the wall. Okay. So be persistent. And also, Jesus says this, Therefore, you should be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, I know it's hard to be perfect, but what he's saying is strive for perfection. I teach students at Cecil College, and I'm constantly telling them, you know, get books on the source. Email me. I'll send you a bibliography of books that, that are good ones to read on craft. Keep going to these conferences and keep striving to make your book better because you never get a second chance to make a first impression, right? You want that book to be perfect. And go the extra mile when it comes to research. These days, research is easy, right? You go on the internet, you Google whatever and find out the answer, but that doesn't necessarily make it authentic. Sometimes you need to go to where you're going the setting of your book and talk to the people, your characters in the book and really sit with them, be with them if you can to make your book authentic. And this goes for fiction or nonfiction. You want it to be authentic. And my next book, The Jealous Son, is set out in the West and it's based on Navajo Indians or native Navajos in Navajo land, they call it, out in Arizona because Adam and Eve were the original people, right? So the original Americans were the Native Americans. So that's why I selected that. Now, having no background or people I even know in, in that field, I Googled and I researched on the internet. I researched each of my Bible stories, by the way, with the Anchor Bible series. It's a really in-depth look into the Bible. And I do read the Bible today, by the way. <laughs> read it front to back and starting over again. But I felt like I still needed to talk to somebody, right? But So I called, my husband works out, uh, his plant, he works at Gore, but they have a plant out in Arizona. And we flew out there and got to know some of the, his coworkers. And when we came back, one of them said, I know, I sent her my book, um, the advanced reader copy, and she said, I know a native Navajo, I can see if they'll read it and authenticate it. They said no. Then she said, well, I have a cousin who knows somebody. I'll ask them. And they said no again. Turns out the Navajo people are very private. Don't want their pictures taken. Don't want to be in books. Don't want to have anything to do with anything that's public. So I was kind of at a loss. And I said, well, I guess it'll just have to be good enough to get out there you know, with the research I've done. I still wasn't comfortable with that, but I didn't know what else to do. And then I heard a speaker at the Baltimore uh, Book, I'm sorry, Baltimore Writers Conference in Towson, Maryland, where I went to school, at high school. And I went out there, and one of the authors, who is on the New York Times bestseller list, said she went, she was doing a story on immigrants, and went all the way down to the wall and camped out for weeks with these immigrants to get the flavor of that and to get to know them so that her characters in her book would be authentic. And that really struck me. Michelle, you need to try harder. You need to go that extra mile, right? So I got back and I got to thinking and I did some more research and I saw Dene College is out in Arizona and it's a native Navajo college. So I picked up the phone and I asked for the PR director. I thought maybe he can help me. He answered the phone and he said, I'm a native Navajo and I'll be glad to read it and I'll, I'll help you edit it and authenticate it. All I had to do was ask, right? <laughs> so I'm very grateful for that. So just, you really want your books to be perfect. 
Okay. And last but not least, you need to have passion. You need to believe in yourself. Jesus says in Matthew, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You only race against yourself, right? You're not supposed to race against the next one who's maybe even writing in your genre because if you compete with them, that's not always good for you. you, you need, but still you need to run the race, right? And he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So believe in yourself. While I'm talking about that competition, I grew up in a very competitive family. Our family reunions, they're like crazy. Like somebody always gets injured, it seems, like playing softball and volleyball and, and three-legged race. And everybody's like, oh, egg toss. If you, if you lose egg toss with your partner, they come after you and throw the egg at you. Um, yeah, crazy big Irish Catholic family. Uh, but I love them. And I grew up with this competitive spirit, always trying to win. And so, because I'm an overachiever and very competitive, I thought, coming out of the gate, that my books would rise to the top. And when they weren't doing that right away, I got frustrated. I forgot that this is in God's timing, first of all. And I also was frustrating with, with God, thinking he should be helping me when I need to do the work, right? <laughs> So I was competing and I met William Paul Young. Does anybody know who he is, the author of The Shack? He came to speak in Cecil County at the uh, right, right to Life, the, the uh, Cecil County Pregnancy Center annual conference. And I was so excited I got to meet him. I had written him a letter and I hadn't heard back uh, because he was kind of a mentor for me. He wrote a, the book, The Shack, which is about the Trinity and kind of pictures in a different light. It was somewhat controversial at the time. And it's since been made into a movie. And I went up to him, I gave him a copy of my signed book and he signed his book for me. And we talked a little bit. And I said, how did you get to selling your books out of the trunk of your car, which he did, that's how he started out. Got a friend to print it who had a printing press, so self-published and grew to sell millions of copies and get it made into a movie. I really wanna know. I was like grabbing onto him practically. And he said, one, one step at a time, just calm down. I guess I was hyper. Uh, <laughs> just, just calm down and just put one foot in front of the other. I thought, what kind of answer is that? I need an answer, right? And I realized I was trying to be him instead of trying to do me. So, and here's the thing. So I went to the Greater Philadelphia Christian Writers Conference where I met my agent. That's another story, but I, um, I sat down with my agent and I was almost in tears. I said, I'm really frustrated that my books aren't doing as well as William Paul Young's book, The Shack, and they're just as good. And he said, uh, William Paul Young won a quarter million dollars on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And that gave him the money to get started to you know, get the book out there, to get it printed, to get, send it out to churches and the media. I said, huh, and I did look it up when I got home and it is true, you just look it up on YouTube. He also ended up in a lawsuit with, that was really bitter with his friend who was the publisher of the book. I don't know how that ended up, it was private, but you can't judge another person's outsides from your insides, right? And you just, so it taught me, don't try to be William Paul Young, just be Michelle Chenoweth, just do you, God will get you there. Back to that Greater Philadelphia Christian Writers Conference. This is about being persistent and passionate and just doing what you have to do. I went to the Greater Philly Writers Conference many years ago, back when the Faithful One was out and I wanted to learn my craft a little better. That's why you should come to the conferences at first um, and, and always. But I also was seeing you know, that there were editors and publishers there and I wanted to meet those people to you know, get my books published and get them out there. They had marketing people there. And I was only able to afford one day out of the four day conference. This was many years ago. It was like $100 a day. So I could only afford the one day. I was, you know, poor, starving artist. 
So I went and I learned everything I could, but then that's when I saw the editors and the agents and I thought, I need to get a literary agent. This was still before Amazon self-publishing. So I saw that they had a contest for Writer of the Year and I decided I'm going to enter that contest and maybe win. And I did the next year. The prize was all four days of the conference. So I thought, wonderful, I'm going to learn even more. And another thing I learned was that speakers sell more books, which I gave a whole presentation to not too long ago. You can sell your books, but when you speak, people are more invested in you. They find out more about you, so they want to see what you wrote, and they buy more of your books. So speaking, again, a good thing, and I saw that. So I said, how can I be a speaker? And I applied to be a speaker at the Greater Philadelphia Christian Writers Conference with straws, like, a thousand people. And the director said, what experience do you have? And I said, hmm, I've talked to some book groups and some church clubs and, well, you need to get more experience, right? I had to pay my dues. Always shooting to the top, but I had to be humbled and come back down and pay my dues. So I started to speak to small writers conferences and one of the ones was Lancaster Christian Writers Conference and guess who was there? the director of the Greater Philly Conference, Marlene Bagnell. And I asked her nicely that time. Um, and then I kind of laid back. I said, I'm not going to pester this woman. And then she invited me to speak. And the, the time I spoke, which was two years ago, is when I met my soon to become literary agent. I sat down with him in tears. We talked. He took one of my books and he said, send me the Jealous Son when it's finished. And I did, and he loved it. And he said, you know, I'll be your agent. He's a real go-getter. And he uh, is also a Christian literary agent and found a Christian publisher for the next book. So one thing does lead to the next. But trust God's timing, pay your dues, do the work. Okay, and follow your heart. And my last P, by the way, I love this topic because it has alliteration and then you saw I use a lot of P words. I just love that. Another good reason I think I was meant to be here today. Matthew says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man that is a merchant seeking goodly pearls. And having found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all he had and bought it. That's how you need to treat your book and your dream. Don't cast it for free among the swine, like, oh, here's my book, here's my book, please read it, and you don't know where it's going. Be selective. Display it proudly, right? We have lots of books over here displayed proudly today. And take a look at, at the winners. Be proud, be proud of what you bring to the table. And I have two writers that I work with right now. I'm editing their books. And both of them have great books, by the way. One is a memoir about his wife who has Alzheimer's disease. And he wrote this really touching memoir. The other one, uh, his name was Mark. The other one, Larry, is writing a nonfiction book, just finished it, on biblical principles in business life. So how you can apply biblical principles, like I hear, did here, to your business practice. And it's a great book. I know it's going to be, make a difference in the world. But both of those writers have questioned all along the way, I don't know if this is good enough to get out there. I don't know if this is really should be a book. And I'm like, yes, yes, I keep encouraging them. But you need to feel it in your heart. You, you can't publish this and hope that it'll sell and get out into the world and get God's message across if you don't believe it and you don't feel it deep down inside and you don't stand behind it. And I think I'm getting, the one is there, I'm getting the other one there. And I'm like, yes, this definitely needs to be published. So again, st stand behind yourself. And there are going to be times when you feel like the only person that believes in you is you, and that's okay, because you got a higher power up there right. that also believes in you. He wouldn't have put it on your heart if he didn't want it to happen, right? 
So last but not least, I just want to wrap it up with saying, get your books out there. Keep writing. Keep your faith. Be warriors of the word. Help build the kingdom. And put pen to purpose. Thank you.